Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Houston, and my colleague in Toronto, Colin Szynski, on Friday, the 7th of August, 2015, and the most important U.S. jobs data since the last one, if I can be so glib. The reason this, this particular uh, report, I think, is, 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 is so important is, I think, as a result of comments made by Fed policymaker Lockhart. Now, while I'm talking, I'm going to be, talk I'm going to be showing you the various disclaimers that um, we have to display for compliance purposes. So you can just sort of, you know, absorb them as you wish while I flick through them. But um, ultimately, they're to protect us, protect our, um, keep our compliance team happy, but also protect you guys as well. So. Basically, the reason this jobs, jobs, jobs data is so important is because of comments made earlier this week by Dennis Lockhart, the FOMC voting member, and he basically said that the bar remained very, very high for him or for the Fed to not raise rates um, in the September meeting. Now, obviously, that set the cat amongst the pigeons, given how the U.S. jobs data has been in recent months. It hasn't been particularly bad, but it hasn't been particularly great either. The unemployment rate is at 5.3%, and it is it's probably it's probably at a multi it's probably at a multi-year low. Um, the concerns I have, and I think probably they're not shared quite by, quite by as many people as probably they should be, is the lack of inflation. Be that as it may, Mr. Lockhart was directly contradicted, or well, not so much directly contradicted, but certainly Mr. Powell, who's a permanent member, a permanent voting member of the FOMC, and there's 10 of them, um, was slightly more circumspect when questioned about the, whether or not we can expect a rate hike in September. And it's not really surprising when you actually look at the unemployment data and then you look at the, the inflation data. And let's not forget here, the Fed has a dual mandate. Yes, they are or do seem very, very keen to pull the trigger on a rate rise. But if there's a cautionary tale in any of this, look at what the Bank of England did yesterday. Look at what the Bank of Japan did, did overnight. Pricing pressures, I think, more than anything, could well keep the Fed on hold. You need a majority of six voting members to vote for a rate hike in September. And at the moment, Mr. Lockhart is the only one who suggested that the bar remains very high for him not to vote for one. So the big question is, is Mr. Lockhart uh, is the equivalent to the UK's Mr. McCafferty? You know, is, is he going to be an outlier? Ultimately, if he is, then we're not going to see a September rate rise. So I think with respect to what we're expecting for these numbers, let's have a quick look at the Bloomberg terminal, because it's not just about US jobs. It's also about Canada jobs. So, and in that context, we're going to have a look at the Canadian dollar in particular, because I think we could get a significant move in that today on the basis of not only the non-farm payrolls data in the US, but also the Canadian jobs numbers as well. And I will hand you over to, J to Colin to explain what he's expecting for the Canadian jobs numbers and what may prompt a strengthening of the Canadian dollar. Thanks very much, Michael. So in uh, Canada, we had an overall uh, decline of about 6,000 jobs last month. The street is looking for an increase of 5,000 this month, and I'm calling for an increase of 10,000 this month. In, uh, in Canada, what we saw last month was we had a full-time employment increase of about 65,000, and that was offset by a part-time decrease of about 72,000 or 71,000. So I think we'll see a little bit of a retrenchment in that. It's July. There is a lot more part-time work in the summer time, so I think we'll see part-time rebound, and I think we'll see full-time retrench a bit, because when we do get these really big increases in full-time jobs, they tend to come back off a little bit the next month. This isn't unusual. The other thing is we've got now got a, a substantially lower Canadian dollar. I think it's too early for the rate cuts to have taken effect, but the uh, the do lower dollar certainly should start to help the, uh, the Canadian economy and mitigate some of the impact of the oil price crash on the, uh, on the oil patch. And... Uh, 
So even though we're still seeing weakness in the energy sector, I think we'll start to see some of the other uh, regions and other parts of the economy pick up the slack. And I am looking for a moderate increase in the uh, in the Canadian jobs this month. The uh, as Michael noted, the loonie's gotten extremely oversold against a number of currencies here, and and it does look like it's getting pretty washed out at uh, at this point in time. And uh, and a lot of that's come from the uh, the decrease in crude oil. So uh, Michael is bringing up right now the pound. Uh, Pound CAD in particular as one. Let's look at this chart, and Colin can explain it. And we, I pointed it out to him, but yesterday, obviously, we saw the Bank of England, uns, rather surprisingly, be slightly more dovish, and that was the reaction, a bearish engulfing. Yeah, it's a big turnaround there. Could you bring up the RSI on this, Michael? I can indeed. Um, you, you carry on talking. What type uh, of RSI would you want? Um, just a traditional would be fine. How many events? Ten? Uh, ten's fine. Right. Because what we're going to show is this, which is this is the same as what we're seeing with the U.S. dollar, which is that um, the CAD weakness, anything against the CAD, um, where the CAD's the, the counter currency is getting really overbought here. So uh, we had one, two, three, four, five at least di uh, moves up into overbought territory over the last little while, and now we're getting this negative divergence here, and it's rolled back under 70. So these are all uh, indications that this move's gotten overdone, that the Canadian dollar has gotten really oversold, and uh, and probably at this point people are going to be more likely to be looking for a reason to start a correction and to move back the other way. And it's not just the um, Sterling Canada chart that um, is sort of bearing. Uh, there, there is a danger of a, of a reversal. We're also seeing it on the dollar CAD, no, though not to the same extent. But ultimately, yeah. here we've got what could potentially be a hanging man on the top side at 132. The key support, I think, really sits at 13060, which is around about 20 points below where we are now. So we're at a quite a key level, I think. In, in, in this regard, and I think if you get a strong Canada number and a weak U.S. dollar number, then you could see dollar CAD drop very, very quickly. Yes, um, below 130. Yes, and I also wanted to know CAD could be active right through the morning at uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 o'clock in London is also the uh, Canadian IV Purchasing Managers report, and uh, that's a, a, a fairly a more volatile reading. But at the same time, it could also uh, have an influence on the on Canadian dollar trading through the day. So it looks like today's probably going to be an active one for the loonie on uh, on for several reasons. Okay, so we've quick, quickly covered that the dollar CAD identified the key levels. And now what we're going to we're going to look at the actual U.S. numbers and the expectations of what we're looking for. Now, you may recall last month average earnings, and these, this is probably one of the more important numbers. The average earnings numbers actually dropped back quite sharply, and the Fed has been worried about wage growth. Janet Yellen articulated it in April that um, she was concerned about the weak nature of wage growth. It was it April or June? It was one of them. It was one of them. I think it was June, actually. She expressed concern about it. And we saw the annual rate drop from 2.3% to 2, and we, saw the, and we saw the monthly rate drop to 0%. So keep an eye on that, because I think if you get a strong average earnings number, that is going to be dollar positive. If we get a strong payrolls number, that's going to be dollar positive. But anything below 250 is probably going to be a little bit woolly. So you may not get much of a reaction if, say, for example, non-farms come in at 240 or 245. It'll still be fairly positive, um, given the fact the dollar has weakened thus far this morning. You look at euro dollar, it's at 109.40. So if you get a strong payrolls number, you could get a move back to around 108.50. If you get a weak payrolls number, so that's anything below, I would suggest, 210, 205 then you could see euro dollar pop up to 109.80 but i don't think it will be strong enough to push it through 110 so again you know it really depends on the strength or weakness of the number anything below 200,000 non farm payrolls say 190 195 you could certainly see euro dollar go up to 110 um, quite quickly the unemployment rate is probably not as important you need to put it into the context of the participation rate and the participation rate is actually very important in that regard because it's at a 35 year low at 62.6 .6. so if the unemployment rate drops and the participation rate drops it's not as bullish as you might think that it is it just means that there's more people dropped out of the workforce and therefore that means that the unemployment rate is artificially 
low. I think really the, the, the key rate for me is the U6 unemployment rate, which I don't think is displayed here. But mm, basically okay. you, you, you drop out of the unemployment numbers if you've been out of work for more than two years. So you're not actually classified as unemployed, even though you're not working. And that's why I think the U.S. unemployment rate is probably not a particularly accurate barometer of the health of the U.S. economy. And that's really what you guys need to bear in mind. If you compare it to the U.K. economy, where the, the participation rate is above 70 percent, it is slightly different. So really it's about not only the non-farm payrolls number, how far away it is from 200,000 and how, you know, whether it's nearer 250 than 200, but also it's about the average hourly earnings. If we get a neutral report, then basically we can probably all go down the pub, and maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. But let's look at some other key areas um, with respect to the, the currencies to start off with, and then we'll, then, we'll look at, and then we'll look at the major indices. Now, for cable, we can see the box range that we're in here. Um, that pretty much gives you the type of range that we're looking at at the moment. We're looking around about 154.60 on the downside, 156.80 on the top side. If we get a breakout on the cable, what I would like to see is a move through 157. And on the downside, with respect to the cable, I'd really want to see a move through 154.5. But even if we do break through that, we've got solid support just below 154 with the convergence of the 100 and 200 day moving averages. So certainly bear that in mind as well. Looking at Euro dollar, it's a similar sort of story. I've already articulated a little bit of it um, in the preamble just now. Big, big support between 108.20 and these lows in the middle of July and the lows of this week, which is around about 108.40.50 on the top side. It's finding it very, very difficult to get through 110. Obviously, you've got these two moving averages here as well, the 50 and the 100 day, which are likely to act as a bit of a cap as well. And obviously, we've got these declining highs. But overall, the oscillator is not really telling me anything. So it's very, very difficult to establish with any degree of certainty what the direction is for euro dollar at this moment in time. Dolly N, slightly more interesting. We broke a key resistance level. Um, earlier this week at 124.75.80, um, but we haven't really managed to really kick on away from it. 125 is acting as a bit of a barrier in the short term. The bigger level is around about 125.80. So again, if we get a number in excess of 240 or 250 on non-farm payrolls, expect Dolly N to shoot higher. If we get a weak number, then again, expect us to drift lower, but not by too much. It's interesting there also, Michael, and that when you're getting a bit of a negative divergence in the stochastics, so you had a higher high in uh, the Look at the July and August highs, higher high mm. in August, lower high on the stochastics, and mm. you're also and now you're moving up into this kind of resistance band between 125, 125, 85 there. Mm. Mm. And uh, if you did, if you if, of course if you hit that 125, 85 and failed, then you have a big double top. Yeah, you do, and the, the bottom of the double top is a bit around about 120 and a half, so yeah. which is the which is the July lows. So that's quite significant. Well, let's have a quick blast through the major indices. This is important in the context of the U.S. small caps because mm -hmm. the U.S. small cap is sitting um, on a very important trend line, but also it's broken below its 200-day moving average, which for me is actually probably, probably significant. It suggests there's a little bit of weakness underlying that. So again, what will cause the U.S. small caps to continue to decline? The S&P 500 is looking a little bit weak, but ultimately, if we look at the S&P 500, it's still in a broad range, but we do appear to be also finding um, Some support in the sorry, I've support again. I've gone and brought out the wrong chart. That's me not paying attention. There we go. So again, we're right on the 200 day moving average on the S&P as well. Now, we have broken below it in the past. But you can see the amount of volatility that we hear. The market is extremely undecided here. You've got long negative candle, long positive candles, then long negative candles. That speaks to me to a market that really can't make up its mind. Ultimately, the bottom of the range is at 2040. The top of the range is around about 2115, 2120, maybe slightly above that. We're slap bang in the middle of it. I don't really have a strong view one way or the other on that. 
and because of that, I think it would take a pretty extreme reading in non-farm payrolls to really kick it one way or the other out of this range. You might get a short swing, but a smaller swing, maybe 10 points or something. But but anything mm -hmm. beyond that to really move it, you'd need a really big reading, like you know, above 250 or below 150 kind of thing to uh, to really move this market. Otherwise, it's probably likely to continue its its ongoing choppiness here. Mm -hmm. And the dollar is looking a little bit weak. I think there's obviously been a leak. Maybe there's been a whisper number of a weak number. Um, so it's just gone up to 109.60. So it's either someone's got a whiff of a weak number or someone is spoofing the market higher and trying to take out a few stops. So this could be quite interesting to digest over the course of the next few minutes. Now, there is one other chart that I need to have a quick look at. FTSE 100, finding a few offers around about 67.50, 67.60. I'm struggling to see where What's, what's going to drive that market higher? Just remember what we were saying about commodity prices, ladies and gentlemen. They continue to remain weak, and that, for me, I think is going to be the key factor over the next month or so, given the fact that the Reuters CRB is at its lowest level since 2003. So is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Oil prices are down 25% since their May highs. We really need to factor all of the, the, these things in. So, you know, are we getting a bad number? We don't know. The FX market seem to think that we might. Let's see. 215, pretty much 215. right down the uh, middle. 215, right down the middle. 0.2 yeah. on average earnings. 5.3 unemployment rate. Let's look mm -hmm. at... Um, Canada was 6K, so slightly full -time above employment, three. Full-time employment change three. minus 17.3 on Canada. Yeah. So as I figured a bit of a retrenchment yeah. on the full time and and that was offset by the 24 increase in the part time. So yeah, we're just kind of we had some extreme readings last month and this is just kind of retrenching that a little bit. Not a, not a big surprise there an overall overall positive number. So 6k decline last month for Canada, 6k increase this month. It's pretty much running flat. So really on it's that, question on oh, so really on a on a Base, on that basis, it's a bit meh. Yeah. There's not really much to say. Canada's slightly weaker, dollar's slightly stronger. You can see from there. But ultimately, I don't think there's really much in that to suggest that we're going to get a significant move higher or lower. Certainly, if you look at that there, we've got a very long lower shadow. We may get a little bit of a move back into this, this candle here. But ultimately, I'll be surprised if we see a move back much above... Um, Back to 132. I don't think we'll see that, do you? No, maybe we might get close to it, but probably not. Where's the time? We've broken above these series of highs here, so we are getting yeah. a little bit of dollar strength. Yeah. Certainly, dolly dolly n appears to reflect that. It's going to 125. Let's see how it reacts above 125 or near 125. That's been the high, ladies and gents, on dolly n for the past few sessions. Is it, are we going to get a few? Are we going to get a few stops triggered as we go through 125? Here we are here. This was the previous peak this week. Might be worth a little small short position. No, actually, I shouldn't say that, should I? Um, not allowed to say that. Um, but uh, certainly if you look at that chart there. There's a short-term double top there. And it's there's so a little bit of a short-term double it. top there. You know, and you've it got the previous highs then, uh... just below 126. You know, maybe it'll want to have a go at it. But, um, yeah. Um, looking at dollar CAD again, certainly certainly testing the weaker side. Let's look at the pound against the dollar. It's the 154.60 level. I'm particularly interested here on the uh, cable. Um, let me go back a little bit further. Any questions, guys, ladies, gents? Just fire them over if you want us to look at something in particular. So I've drawn a li line through these lows here, but ultimately what I'm interested in here is. That number there, and that's around about 154.60, 154.65. There we go. Let's extend that across. And these lows here. See, so yeah. So I mean, apart from those twin lows there in the week beginning the 13th of July, we haven't really been below 154.60. So. So certainly, certainly on that basis, I don't really think there's anything too much to get excited about with respect to these numbers, Colin. 
I think we're going to test the ISO, we're going to test the boundaries of the ranges. But ultimately, I think as we head into the weekend, these ranges should remain intact. I agree. These numbers are pretty much they're not that they're not far enough off of uh, off of expectations to uh, to really move anything. So it looks like we'll, we'll probably people will be now sitting back and waiting for the next I guess waiting for the next day to report really mm. on uh, on this one because this probably doesn't really tip the balance for either side really at this point. It's just middle of the road and things just keep on tracking. Yeah. So overall, I think it's positive for September. It certainly doesn't take September off the table. No, definitely um, not. It's still definitely on the table. not. Um, but I think in the context of pricing, the labour market's fine for the Fed. For me, it's about inflation or the lack of it now. And um, if, you, if you look at what's happening in commodity markets, um, I will look at the DAX, sir. Um, I've just been asked about the DAX, mm -hmm. the Germany 30. We'll look at that in a minute. With respect to prices, for me, I think, you just you just can't ignore the fact that every single central bank this year has cut rates. There hasn't been one single central bank that has cut rates. But in the last 18 months, every central bank that has raised rates has had to cut them again. Bank of New Zealand, Bank of Canada. Uh, the Bank of Canada cut rates and uh, raised rates in the last 18, did it? No, they raised rates about five years ago, but then oh, they've cut them back okay. now. They cut them back. No, I'm thinking of the RBNZ, aren't I? Yes, so I think they're, they're the ones that who did, did that. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's a nice old age catching up with me, Colin. <laughs> See, that's why I've got you as a backstop. Okay, so let's look at the Germany 30, the DAX. I mean, the, the direction of travel there, we've, we, we've finally broke out of this downward channel, but ultimately what we haven't done is really taken out these highs from May. All, all, we, all we've really done is we've slowed the pace of the decline off the highs. And for me, I think if you're looking for what we, I think what we really need to see here with the DAX or the Germany 30 is a move towards, uh, move through 11,800. Otherwise, what I think we're going to see is a slow drift back down. I think as with a lot of the other indices, we're in a range. We're, in, we're at the top of that range. We've just come off the back of seven successive daily rises. And now we're looking to consolidate a little bit at these highs, maybe drift back down to around about 11,400, 11,500. But ultimately, I think um, we've topped out in the short to medium term and we'll probably come back and test this little line that I'm going to draw in from here like that which also happens to nicely coincide with with this line that I've drawn in through here. So what we've got here going on is a little bit of a sideways consolidation on the Germany 30. The oscillator is starting to roll over a little bit. And I think as we head into the end of the week, we started the week down here. And I think as we drift into the weekend, we'll probably drift down back to around about 11,500. We've made some good gains this week. There's not really, I think, any indication that um, we're going to get a, um, a significant move either way now, and if anything, we'll probably drift in. We'll pr probably drift a little bit lower into the close. Um, Sterling Canada is on the move. Let's have a quick look at that, Colin, because okay. that was something that we were looking at before before we um, before we uh, came in. So obviously, this is a daily daily chart here. We're getting a little bit of a It's still basically it, coming off. Yeah, we're still coming still off. Above but two, I think but it's still coming off. What I would look for for this, I think, if I'm looking to get short of that, I'd sell it into a move around about 204, 204.20 perhaps, with a stop loss above that. Why 204.20? Well, I think it's just simply because... Retest of that previous low there. Uh, yeah. And it was also just around about the peaks here. So what you've got is a congestion point we call this a congestion point, where highs and lows sort of tend to coalesce and come together. And um, you may get a little bit of selling interest in that corridor there between 203.90 and 204.20. The oscillator or the RSI is starting to push higher a little bit. So, you know, at the moment, you might get I think an oversold bounce here, but you not, might get an not oversold necessarily bounce. a big run at the highs. But I don't think what I don't think what will happen is I'll be surprised if we break back above 204, 
for any significant length of time. Yeah. And when you're looking at something at the RSI, by the way, would you, if we do have something where it's getting oversold and then uh, and then it starts to pop, if, if the RSI then starts to fail around 50, that's confirmation that you've gone into a, into a uh, into a downtrend. When you were in this rising trend the last couple of weeks, you'd push up into overbought territory, keep going, but you had your RSI was getting consistently bouncing up off of 40. If you've got a trend change, then what you'd start seeing is the RSI running into resistance 50, 60, and, uh, and then pushing into oversold that's indicative of more indicative of a downtrend and we're just starting to see that uh, that tipping point possibly come in with the last uh, where RSI had dropped from 60 to 30 like it did uh, earlier this week yeah absolutely sound, pretty pretty sound pretty sound that mate um, so let's have a quick look at Apple because I think there's been an awful lot of talk this week that um, you know Apple was starting to drag and the broader U.S. market lower. I did a, I did a um, did a video earlier this week about Apple and the potential for a, a little bit of a decline. So let's have a quick look at that. Um, what we've got here, obviously Apple's not open at the moment, but um, we've we've seen a little bit of a break lower. We've seen a break below the 200-day moving average. Why is that significant? Well, because it's the first time we've been below the 200-day moving average since 2013. We did briefly break below it um, here, around about here, but that also happened at the same time as the 50-day crossed above the 200-day moving average, which is a golden cross. Mm -hmm. Now, golden cross tends to be fairly bullish, so in this case, even though we dropped below the 200-day moving average, because the 50 crossed above the 200, that, those, those two indicators counteracted each other. So you probably wouldn't have gone short on that break because of the contradiction between the two indicators. What we've got here is the 50-day moving average is starting to roll over towards the 200-day. The 200-day has been breached. Now what we have got here, which is a little bit of a, which is a little bit of hope, is we've got a counter-attack line. A counter-attack line is whereby you get a strong down move on the one hand, and then the the following day's candle comes back and opens lower, comes back and retests and closes above the open, sorry, closes above the close of the previous candle. So it counterattacks the move more or less completely. What we need to see now happen with respect to this Apple move is for it to hold above uh, the lower candle here from yesterday's price action, which we can establish is round about. $114, give or take, and for it to move back to around about 119 Yeah, you'd really want it to fill in that gap Yeah, at the top of your circle there. Yeah, right there, there. Is a, there is a bit of a gap there, so we need to fill that in. Um, we'll see where we open today. Um, certainly, if I'm looking at the S&P right now, it's slightly lower, so there is a concern that we might drift back down. Ultimately, I don't think we've seen the bottom in Apple. I think we could come back to this line down here, and that's the trend line that I've drawn in from the lows. Go to the one-week chart of 2013. Okay, we've also we we are potentially also going to be closing below the 55, sorry, the 50-week moving average. So, 50-week moving average potentially quite negative, but when you look where the 200-week moving average, there's still plenty more downside in this without without us coming out of the overall uptrend. And you know, that for me is probably more important than anything else. It's not just about um, the correction itself, it's does it actually undermine the overall uptrend. And in this context for me it doesn't. And when you actually look at the fundamentals of Apple, which you can do here with our Morningstar research um, capability. Let me just quickly get that working. Um, we can see that the quantitative fair value estimate for Apple is $125 an ounce. According to the metrics, it is undervalued. Certainly, it's undervalued relative to its peers. But I think there's an awful lot of people who are disappointed with the Apple Watch, me included. Um, I think it's a bit of a waste of money. It's certainly not something I can get enthusiastic about. And I like Apple products. I've got an iPad beeping away next to me. You probably could hear it in the background while I was talking with all the news alerts coming out. But, you know, if I compare, look at Apple, I look at that stock and I think I actually quite like that stock. I think it's fairly valued. But then if I go and look at something, say, for example, like Netflix, which Colin, you covered. Unbelievable. 
is this is just parabolic. I mean, this is just totally, totally parabolic since the beginning of the year. We've gone from $35, 40, $45 to $130. But let's look you've at the blown through the top. You had a rising yeah. channel, and you've just ripped through the top of that, and it's it's gotten way ahead of itself. And now look at the quantitative fair value here, 99.8. But more importantly than that, look at the Ford PE right here, 555.6. Current price earnings is 278.5. And now, even, even for people, if, oh man, go on, Colin. No, go on. You go ahead. Even for people that think, okay, fine, well, Netflix is eating everybody's lunch and it's growing like crazy. I, I did a, uh, a blog uh, overnight that showed that looked at the pre, uh, the PE to earnings growth, where you say, okay, the uh, your, your people will pay for growth, so your PE should be equivalent to your your growth rate, and so par would be one. And most of the media sector trades between about 0.5 and two. Netflix's PE, uh, PE to growth ratio is 14. It's it's insane. That's like bubble levels. That's that's tech uh, tech bubble kind of uh, kind of valuations on uh, on Netflix to the point that even if it does deliver on the growth that that people think is out there, it's still ridiculously overpriced relative to that. So it's uh, it's quite vulnerable here. Any kind of a hiccup out of Netflix and that thing could be in uh, could be in trouble. And you look at the and you look at the price earnings in the four PE for Apple, which basically you know is a cash it's a cash cow. 13.3, 11.5. If any stock is undervalued, it's this one. Netflix is a bubble about to explode. Wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. That's not a recommendation, by the way. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's, you know, you, but then again, you know, it's markets like a, can... It's like you get to the top of something and then it doesn't take much, just a little breath to, to kind of push it over once it, once it reaches that kind of uh, exhaustion. It wouldn't take much to send that back the other way. A little little puff of wind, and then suddenly gone. Yeah. So have a quick, quick, let's have a quick look at commodities. Let's have a look at crude oil, because that, for me, is also quite important. And we can see that here, that we're approaching a key support level on WTI, around about $44 a barrel. Um, but ultimately, we still can go all the way back to the March lows of $42 a barrel. And certainly, if you're looking at the supply and demand dynamics of crude oil, um, this, this, this Iran nuclear deal and everything else, I think it's perfectly feasible that we can go all the way back there. You, you look at crude oil, you look at the direction of travel, we may get a bounce back to 49 or $50 a barrel, but I, I, serious, I sincerely believe that if crude oil stays at these sorts of levels and commodity prices stay at these sorts of levels, it's going to be very, very difficult to make the argument for a Fed hike in September. doesn't say that it won't be difficult to make the argument for it in December, but I think it's more than likely we'll get it in we'll get it in December if we get it at all. I'm starting to think that the Fed might hint in September, and and increasingly, I'm pretty sure they're going to do the sneak through one in, in December, like they did uh, with tapering a couple of years back. Yeah, I think I think you could well be I think you could be right there, um, Colin, most definitely. Um, yeah, and you're right about the inflation. I mean, it's still struggling here. It wouldn't, once we took out the uh, the 61 per, uh, percent retracement, it pretty much suggested you were looking at a full round trip. And uh, and the way that's been trending since, sure, it looks like it wants to be doing a full round trip. What will be interesting is once it gets back into the uh, that 42 area where it bottomed out before, and you get close to that 40 round number, is uh, is will it will it then start to find support? Or do you uh, do you breach that? The 08 low was around 35, but even going back, a lot of the um, OPEC ministers and stuff like that over the course of the last year or so have have uh, have talked about that kind of 40 level being a, being a big one. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, this this 40 levels, the round number, they're always they're always nice round numbers, and they're always you know very very um, susceptible to aggregation of buy and sell orders in and around those sorts of areas. Brent crude is just as important. If we look at that here, um, worked it off the 2010 lows. We can see from here, look at where it was in May. It's around about $67, $68 a barrel. Look where it is now. It's below $50 a barrel. And it's finding itself very, very comfortable below $50 a barrel, which means that we could potentially come all the way back to 45, having broken below the March lows, which had initially acted as a little bit of support we're now back below it, and we now look as if we're probably going to head towards $40, $40 $48, 
47, 46 and 45 over the course of the next few sessions. Yes, we are oversold, but the momentum is with the price. And when the momentum is with the price, you stay with the momentum trade and, 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 and the direction of the trend. Very dangerous to pick the bottom. Well, as, so, as we look at the WTI chart, it could just stay oversold for quite a while. Brent isn't, yeah. isn't quite as far along on the being oversold as WTI is, and that has continued to trend lower. Yeah, exactly. You can see it here. We hit bottom there on the on the slow stochastic there, and we just carried on going down. You know, we stayed below 20% the whole time. If we get back above 20%, we could see a short squeeze, but at the moment, the momentum is negative. We can see that here and the likelihood is it's likely to remain so. Now, we could get a stabilization around here, which could make, push this back up into slightly more positive territory, but at the moment, the momentum does appear to be favoring, um, favoring the dollar over the oil price. You look at copper, it's a similar sort of story. Um, again, very oversold, multi-year lows, and you know the only thing that I can think would probably turn that around is the Chinese data that we've got coming out next week. So, mm -hmm. so there. I mean, that's basically something we could cause a commodity price rally next week. Is the Chinese data, which is out in the middle of the week, I think Wednesday morning. So it might be worth keeping an eye on that next week. Um, unless anyone has any other questions on the chat, then Colin and I will wrap this um, wrap this uh, webinar up. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the session, ladies and gents. We'll post it online in the next 12 hours. Otherwise, um, we'll see you again um, this time next month for the next most important U.S. payrolls report. Yeah, then the next one will be uh, will be a little bit closer to the meeting. So I think even if you do get a uh, inline readings like you do this time, we'll probably see a bigger a bigger reaction. Plus, we've got the. Uh, the, uh, for the Fed, it's, there's the uh, Jackson Hole meeting at the end of this month as well, which is right around the same, just before the non-farm payrolls report. Mm. I think it's a couple one, of days. One other thing, ladies and gents, we will be doing a preview to the FOMC meeting on the day of the, the statement and the press conference. So tune in for that because we might have a little bit more color to add to the canvas with respect to that. There are details of it on our um, education webpage, cmcmarkets.co.uk, and then click on the education section to sign up for that, because I think that could be fairly interesting. You know, you know, so we will do it four hours before the announcement. Yes, indeed. And this month our analyst debate is on the 20th, correct? I think so. I can't remember without Thursday looking the it 20th. up. It'll be on the, um, it'll on be the on website. The website. But uh, no, the, the September one will be a preview to the FOMC, so you really need to tune in for that. Otherwise, ladies and gents, thanks very much for listening, and um, have a great weekend. Fantastic, everyone. Thanks for joining us.